Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 3, and then I'm going to jump over to verse 11. And this is what it says. Now all the tax gatherers and sinners were coming near him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he told them this parable, saying, then in verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. And he began to be in need, and he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger? I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put it on a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and, and kill it. Let us eat and be merry for the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a commandment of yours. And yet you have never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. But when this son of yours, when he came who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, My child, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Pray with me. Let's pray. Lord, you bring dead to life. Breathe your life in us this morning that we might not only hear your word, but we might know your character and respond. Respond. It's in Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. I don't remember the event. I don't remember the event, but I do remember the feeling. My brother, my sister, all the in-laws were at my parents' house. All our children, all the cousins were there as well. And we had finished eating dinner. The adults were upstairs and all the cousins, all the kids were downstairs in kid heaven. My father had made this huge room full of children's toys. And we knew as long as there was noise down there, things were okay. When it got quiet, then we all began to worry. We knew that they were either plotting revolution or blood had been spilt. And <laughs> we, we were always kept our eyes keen for the silence. It got quiet downstairs. That's when we, we got quiet upstairs and began to listen. We could hear all the boy cousins whispering to one another, I'm not going to do it, you do it. And then the other one said, no, I'm not going to, you do it. And then finally my son, the youngest of all the, all the boys, he piped up and he said, well, I'll do it. He was about six years old at the time, and that's when we heard him pad up the stairs. He came to the table, and he said, Pops, he turned to my dad, he said, Pops, he said, can we play pool on your pool table? That's when my father turned to my son and he said, he said, well, there's dust on the cover. So when you take the dust off the cover, make sure not to spill all that dust on the pool table. It takes a long time for me to clean off the pool table when you, dust, when you, you dump the dust from the cover onto the table. And you boys, you like to get my pool sticks and play swords with them and you knock off the tips. I don't want you playing swords with my pool sticks. And just look up at the ceiling. Every time you boys celebrate and you lift your stick, you poke a hole in my ceiling and you can see all the places where you've poked holes in. Don't be poking holes in my ceiling. The whole time my son was going, yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. No, sir. My father finished talking and my son began to walk away. He took about two steps and he turned back around to my dad and he said, Pops, was that a yes or a no? <laughs> well, sometimes, yes, if you put enough rules and instruction around, it can sound a whole lot like no. Well, that's, that's the world that Jesus came to. A world that if God's yes sounded a whole lot like no. Because they put so many rules, so many instructions, so many details, so many prohibitions around everything that they were to, to do. God's yes sounded a lot like no. And that's all that folks heard from God was no. And that's why Jesus came. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's nature. Jesus came so we would know the nature of God, so we would know the character of God, so we would be able to recognize the voice of God, so we would be able to hear the yes, the yes of God. So Jesus tells three parables. The first parable, he tells a story about a shepherd who has 100 sheep. One of them goes missing, and the shepherd didn't say, well, 99's pretty good. I'll stick with the 99. No, this shepherd went out to find the one that was lost. He searched. He pursued after the one that was lost, and, and when he found him, he put him on his shoulders, and he brought him back to the fold. And he didn't just bring him back to the fold and say, well, that's done. No, he, he had a celebration and he called everyone that he knew to, to come around to celebrate with him, to enter into his joy is what he asked them to do, to rejoice. And th they entered into his joy. But that wasn't the last story that Jesus told. The next story Jesus told it was about a woman who had 10 coins. Well, one of those coins went missing. And she didn't say, well, you know, nine's just about as good as 10. I'll stick with the nine that I have. Nope. She broke out the lamp, she, broke, she pulled out her broom, and she began to sweep, she began to search, she began to look everywhere until she find, found the one coin that was missing. And then she called others to celebrate with her, to enter into her joy, to rejoice with her. Now, 
if a sheep is valuable and a coin is even more valuable, the most valuable thing is a child. So Jesus tells this story that I read this morning about a father who had two sons. And one of his sons went to the father and said, Father, I've been looking around. I noticed you have some pretty neat stuff here. And um, I know it, when you die, I'm going to get that stuff, but I don't want to wait till then. I'd like the stuff now. Well, surprising thing. The father says, yes. He gives the son his share of the inheritance, and then it says that that son went to a distant country. He went on a journey to a distant country where he squandered it on loose living. Now, that's everything it says right there. He squandered it on loose living. Years ago, I heard a preacher, clearly half of the sermon was on what loose living meant. That this, he said this boy went out, he bought a Cadillac, fifth of liquor, and began chasing women. Well, that tells a little bit more about what's in the preacher's heart than it does about what's in the story. Because it doesn't say all that. It says loose living. He squandered it all on loose living. And then, to make matters worse, a famine came. Well, he had to find any kind of work he could find just to survive. And the only work he could find was feeding pigs. Now, my hunch is that the, when the hearers of this story heard Jesus tell the story for the first time, and a Jewish boy feeding pigs, what could be worse than that? They couldn't imagine anybody could ever hit rock bottom lower than a Jewish boy feeding pigs. But there was one step lower. It says, and he longed, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. That's the one step lower. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine. Now, it doesn't say what those pods were, but I know. It was okra. When you start wanting okra, you've hit rock bottom. It doesn't make any difference if that okra is boiled or pickled or fried. It's a vegetable that has hair on it. And when you start longing for a vegetable that, ha that has hair on it, that's a vegetable that says run away. When you start wanting to eat that, you know you've hit rock bottom. It's about the worst it could be. That he, he longed to eat. I have a friend that, <laughs> that said he ate so much okra, when, uh, so much boiled okra when he was growing up, that old slimy stuff, that his socks won't stay up now. <laughs> it's just not to be eaten but he longed for this okra and that's when he came to his senses when he hit the very bottom and he began to think about his father not about his father's stuff but his father's character and about the way that his father treated his own hired men that his his hired men ate well. They had more than enough to eat. So he came up with a plan. He said, I'll, I'll go to my father. I'll say, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Here I can imagine that he practiced it again and again and again as he was making his way back to his father. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And in verse 20 is maybe the most beautiful verse in the, in the whole of the Bible. Luke 15 verse 20. It says... But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. That while he was still a long way off, his father's eyes were pe peeled on the horizon. His father's eyes were searching and seeking for the sun that was off in the distant country. While he was still a long way off, his father, his father was watching and seeking for him. And his father ran and embraced and kissed him. And that's when the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. 
I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father cuts him off right there. And he says, quickly, bring a robe. Bring a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. For this son of mine who was dead has come to life. Tonight we're going to eat steak. (laughs) That's what he said. He said, take the fattened calf and kill it. But that's what he meant. Tonight we're going to eat steak. We're going to have joy. Joy is going to be spread all all around. It's going to be a celebration. That God's yes isn't just a whispered yes. God's yes is a resounding yes. That this boy, this son of mine, has gone from okra to steak. He's gone from death to life. He's gone from rock bottom to the joy of the Father. Well, wouldn't it be great if the story ended right there? But the story doesn't end right there. There's a story of the brother that stayed home, the child that stayed home. He was out in the field. He heard the celebration. He heard the music. He heard the dancing. That's what it says here. And my hunch is he also smelled the steak. And he asked, what's going on down there? Well, the servant tells him, this brother that was, was lost has been found and your father's having a celebration. Well, that's when the brother that stayed home refused to go in. And that's when the father, the father who, who saw the other brother while he was still a long way off, saw this brother while he wasn't that far off at all. This brother who still refused to come into the house He went out to see that brother. And it says he began to entreat him. And to to invite him into the party. To invite him into to the father's yes. Into the celebration of life. But that's when this brother said that this this son of yours who squandered your, your estate... He's come home, and, and, and all I wanted was a, a kid, a goat, that I might be married with my friends, but I didn't even get that. Here's where I can imagine that the father's arm went around that son, and he said, son, what do you see in that field over there? And the son said, daddy, you know what I see. It's a hundred of the best cattle anywhere around here. How do you know it's a hundred of the best cattle? And the son said, because I'm the one that made sure they found water. I'm the one that made sure that they found pasture. And tell me, what do you see in that field over there? It's a hundred of the best goats anywhere around here. How do you know they're the best goats? Because I'm the one that made sure they found pasture. I'm the one that made sure that they found water. And what do you see in that field over there? A hundred of the best sheep anywhere around here. How do you know they're the best sheep? Because I'm the one that made sure they were sheared. I'm the one that made sure they found pasture. I'm the one that made sure that they found water. And the father says, yes, that's right. All of this is yours. But what you really want is a goat. One goat that you can call mine. One goat that you can call mine. Is that, is that really, really what you want? Jesus is telling this story. This story that, that points to a, to a father. A father that pursues. A father that seeks. A father that searches. A father whose eye is on the horizon. And, and by the way, A father whose eye is just outside the door. A father whose yes pursues the son far away and the one that's that's not that far away at all. Before the son at a distance or the son outside the door has done a thing. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait till we made it home. He didn't wait till we were as good as we could be. That he runs and embraces. He goes to the field where the sun is. 
and he pursues and he speaks and he entreats and he invites. But the story doesn't end in a a God that just pursues and seeks and seeks and seeks. That God's desire for his sons, for his daughters, for all his children is that they respond. That they enter into his joy. That they enter into his yes. That they enter into the celebration. That when Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and for me, he took all those things that would destroy us. He took our selfishness that seeks stuff to take off into a distant country. He he takes all our selfishness that seeks just the, the mine to stay just outside the door. He takes the sin, the selfishness, the shame. He takes the fear. He takes the worry. He takes all those things that would destroy us. And he he takes those things on himself and he he nails it to the cross to kill it once and for all. And, And when Jesus rose from the grave for you and for me, he rose that his power, the power all over all those things that might destroy us, that that power that, might, that, that it might live within us. That we just don't know. We don't sit in a distant country eating okra, knowing the, 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 the nature of God, that we respond to it. That we don't sit just outside the door smelling the steak, but not taking part in it, knowing that the, the, the character of God He wants us to dine with them, to enter into his joy, to enter into his celebration. Jesus said, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. The Father's desire is that, that we respond that we receive Christ, that we dine with Him, that we enter into His joy, that we share His joy, and that we spend time, time with Him. But that's not the end. That's not the end that, that, that we receive that, that justifying grace or that grace that... that that, that responding grace, that, that we move beyond that to a life. Life, that's the word that Jesus uses, that the Son has gone from death to life, that we receive a life that's, that's transformed. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He says, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells in you. That when Jesus rose from the grave, He rose that His Spirit might live in you, might live in me, and that our lives might be transformed to have a fruit, fruit, in the here and now, that the way we live now, this day might be different, that it might be marked with the way that Galatians chapter 5 puts it, with a love, a joy, a peace, a patience, a kindness, a goodness, a gentleness, a faithfulness, a self-control. It comes not from the the strength of will, but from the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the risen Christ, alive in you, alive in me. It's a grace of the Father that transforms. It's the grace that gives power for children to respond 
It's a grace. It gives a life that's, that's transformed. This morning, it may be that God has given you a, a nudge or a shake or a thump on the head. And that, that when I begin to talk about the sun that, that sat off in the distant country, or maybe the son that sat just outside the door wanting to claim what's mine is mine. Did you realize that, that maybe God's given you a nudge that you've been trying to, to claim a certain portion of your life as your own? That you've tried to withhold it from God as if, this, if in some way there was some kind of life or joy that that came from withholding. God doesn't ask for a little piece of us or a little more of us. His desire is for the whole of us. Life. Not just all but a little piece that we might call mine. He asks for all of us. transformed life that we might know what true joy is what true peace is this morning it may be that that during this pandemic that you've tried to to pull apart pull apart from god's joy that you've tried to to pull apart and and and, and hold something it might be you've tried to hold on to your, to your worry. You've tried to hold on to your fear and called it your fear. Or it may be that you've tried to hold on to your stuff as if it, it all belonged to you. God has more for, for you and me than that. And I want to invite you to pray with me right now. Let's pray. Jesus not only is, is it this day that belongs to you, it's our lives that belong to you. And this morning we come to you asking for forgiveness that we've tried to, to pull apart a little segment apart to call mine, that we've been withholding, thinking that if, if we stay in control, there might be some kind of life in it. And about the best we can do is maybe okra. Maybe the best we can do is a little goat. But you have so much more. You have a depth of joy that we can't imagine. Life. Full, abundant, eternal. A life that's transformed with a love and joy and peace patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness, a life of self-control that's guided by your Spirit. Lord, grant us grace enough to let go, to let go of the smallness, the selfishness, the self-centeredness, the sin, the fear, the worry all those things that would conquer us and allow you to allow your spirit to have your way with us that we might hear your yes and respond. Breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Fill us with life, new life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock 
and 1115 AM. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>